Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I am joined, as always, by my fantastic co hosts, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. Uh, and today we are blessed to be joined uh, by Brittany Laughlin, uh, Executive Director of the Stacks Foundation team. Um, so, Brittany, how's it going today? It's going pretty good. <laughs> good morning. Fantastic. <laughs> and evening and afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to have you here. So, question to get us going, Brittany. Um, Stax originates from 2013 um, and has its own origin story. But what is your Stax story? How did you end up getting involved in this? Uh, where did you come from? What's the uh, the origin story of your of your you know uh, character in this movie? Yeah. Oh, great okay. question. Um, yeah, it's it's almost as old as the block stack story itself. So I was on the venture capital side. I was at Union Square Ventures, um, and we were looking at at the time at something called Bitcoin Tech in 2013. And we, I remember, we had this day in San Francisco where we had like 10 different Bitcoin tech companies pitch us, and like most of them were like true anarchists and like wanting to like take down <laughs> big governments and stuff. Um, so a lot of those, uh, a lot of those pitches we realized weren't very fundable from like a big VC perspective. Um, but we did have a meeting with um, this team, Brian and Fred, who at the time were pitching this Bitcoin wallet called Coinbase. And so that uh, meeting, we're like, wow, they, you know, they're really compelling. They're backable. You know, they understand that like regulation is going to play a role in like having to work with, you know, getting the right licenses and stuff. So, um, yeah, so we invested in Coinbase back then. And that started my crypto journey because I started learning about Bitcoin. You know, I kind of bought like a modest amount, like back when it was $200 and I uh, was like, oh, yeah, this is cool. I'll just kind of keep this. But at the time, it had a, a big reputation for things around like Silk Road and kind of this, you know, black, uh, you know, black markets and dark web and all that. So um, we kind of were like, OK, well, what's what comes after just money? Because like money is interesting, but um, there has to be like non-financial applications of the blockchain. Um, and so we were looking for that. And through that thesis, we actually found Maneev and Ryan, who were starting this project at the time, was called One Name which is now Stacks today. So we really like their vision of like bringing more utility to chains um, like Bitcoin. And so uh, we invested in 2014. I sort of followed the team as an investor um, for a number of years before uh, 2019. Uh, so it's almost three years actually to the day that I, I went full-time working uh, for Stacks. So first I worked for what's now Hero Systems helping them with their Reg A Plus offering. And then uh, about a year and a half ago, um, spun out to kind of launch the Stacks Foundation. So the mission really about education, providing grants, uh, funding infrastructure, all of these key pieces in the ecosystem. Um, so yeah, it's been kind of three years full-time, but prior to that, um, I've known the team since 2014 and just been incredibly impressed by their diligence, their vision and their pursuit of like, we're going to do things the right way. We're going to do things <laughs> the hard way, but we're not going to kind of just like try and launch it and like, and then like abandon it or just make a bunch of money and leave or something like that, which having been in the industry so long, there are a lot of people that kind of had that mission and maybe they achieved it or not, but it's been nice to be with a project for seven going on eight years now. That's uh, that's pretty cool. It's, uh, it's interesting that it's been this kind of like uh, the way you got into crypto or uh, Bitcoin is via uh, via kind of the business side of things, I suppose, because it's say, as you say, it was through like getting to understand Coinbase, and then that is what uh, got you into it, just which is kind of cool. I guess before I ask you to explain uh, to our listeners what Stacks is, question first is like, hey, so you got where well, you were obviously watching from the investment side. What made you decide to get involved full time three years ago uh, to the day? What was it that, that got you to do that and, and actually take that step into you know? boom, I'm going, you know, to, to work with them. Yeah. Well, like at the time, you know, being on the investor side, we're like looking for people building new things. And um, at USV, especially, we always try to take this approach of like, what future do you want to live in? And then how do we fund the things today that we want to be part of our future? So, you know, if we want this like more open internet, we want people to compete with Google and Facebook and not like every big tech just gets sucked up in these big, like controlling monoliths. It was like, okay, we need to fund things that are helping builders. 
um, compete or like just provide a different opportunity that doesn't exist yet. Uh, but what I found is like investing even in like 2017, the ICO boom, there was just so much money and it was being thrown at like a lot of questionable <laughs> projects and things like that. And there wasn't a, enough people like building real things. And so it was kind of like, well, if I want this future to exist, I think it might be too early to even think about investing. Um, instead, thinking about like, where can I bring skills to like support talent? And so it was like, I don't want to raise a crypto fund and just sit on the sidelines and kind of be like, oh, here's some money, here's some money. There are plenty of other people doing that. But it was like, okay, how can I like actually move the needle on something? And I was, you know, I built two companies before I was on the venture capital side. So like, I'm an operator at heart. And so I was like, okay, I want to do something that is hard and challenging and work with smart people who are thinking about the world the way I am. And let me find that. So, um, you know, a few months, I kind of worked with a few projects, got to kind of be like a fly on the wall with, um, you know, learning from a bunch of different crypto projects. And Stacks just like kept coming up as this really interesting place to build because of their focus on building on Bitcoin because they wanted to take this regulated route, which was very contrarian <laughs> at the time. Um, and because like, I think my skill set was like a good fit for what they needed, which was like, okay, they, we were gonna go talk um, to investors and try and educate them about the technology, um, help you know, retail investors understand what the technology was because we actually did like a regulated offering. We got qualified by the SEC so we could offer it to US people. So that was like pretty revolutionary at the time. Um, yeah, so it kind of was like a, a mix of things, but I was like, if I really care about this industry, I need to like be investing with my time, not just my money. That's uh, okay. Yeah, that's cool. So it kind of like uh, definitely comes to this idea that um, you kind of wanted more of a, yeah, more of like a direct involvement. So it's like, hey, I'm really interested in this. I would like to actually make a very like uh, on the ground difference to where the market's going, how things are going and kind of see it move forward uh, myself, which is kind of cool. Okay. Um, well, I guess now that sets me up perfectly for the next question. Um, and, and then I promise I'll, I'll let Ricardo and Jerry ask questions. I just wanted to ask this one, which is uh, for everyone out there listening, um, what is Stacks? And yeah. what is it all about? So Stacks is a blockchain. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, the goal is to be able to bring more utility to Bitcoin. So we actually reuse the hash power of Bitcoin. So we don't need like brand new, um, you know, miners using a lot of electricity. Instead, our miners take Bitcoin, they spend it in order to mine new Stacks blocks. So it is proof of work, but it's a little bit different. Um, so it's called proof of transfer. And like, that's important because some of the key aspects of Stacks tie into why that consensus is there. So one, the goal is to reuse the security of Bitcoin. So we don't need to worry about like big um, security hacks in terms of like hash power because we already are using the most secure chain. Um, two, right now Bitcoin does not actually do that much. It's actually really hard to, to um, run something like a smart contract. We see these in Ethereum and other networks, but Bitcoin doesn't have that ability. So with Stacks, it actually enables, you know, running your smart contract through the Stacks blockchain, but then the finality is always on the Bitcoin chain. So what's great about that is that it means that you can scale and you're not going to slow down the Bitcoin chain, but that ultimate settlement is in the Bitcoin chain. So people like that. Um, and the third is that uh, we have something in our consensus uh, called stacking. So all of those miners who are taking Bitcoin and spending them to mine new stacks blocks, some of that Bitcoin gets burned, it like gets completely destroyed. Um, and some of it gets redistributed back to people who are holding their tokens and stacking. So if you have stacks, you can commit to locking them for two week cycle and you get like a small Bitcoin reward for that. Right now it's currently like a 10% yield in Bitcoin for holding your stacks. And what's great about that is that it opens up these new interesting things that people are building on top. Like people are thinking about NFTs that earn yield because they're built on stacks and this Bitcoin yield is part of the chain. Um, people have built things like city coins which is like the city of Miami has a wallet and some of those Bitcoin rewards get redirected to a wallet for the city of Miami. So that um, they've been able to actually give to the city of Miami. Miami's mayor has accepted it. They're using it to pay for some low income housing. There's some really interesting things because you get a yield for participating in the chain in this certain way. 
So that's like a little in the details, but the high level is you can think of it as a smart contract platform, similar to an Ethereum, but really leveraging the power of Bitcoin and extending the utility of it. Oh, thanks. That's, uh, that's awesome. So I guess it's like, um, it's not a layer two specifically because like, like Lightning Network, uh, and I guess it's, it's not really a side chain like Liquid, I don't think. It's more like its own chain that uses the sort of the security of Bitcoin and stability and et cetera, et cetera to then do other things. But obviously it's like kind of reliant on Bitcoin, but obviously it's its own thing at the same time. I guess I'm yeah, yeah. Right. Some people are oh, like, Bitcoin. oh, is this a layer two? Is it what? It's like we're like it's a layer one point five. <laughs> so gotcha. um, yeah, I think there's like just some outdated information. On, like, like why do we even care if it's layer one or layer two? But yeah, it's not like lightning where it's you know sort of side chains. But um, oh. you know, I think we're in the same mindset as things like uh, lightning, where it's like we want it to be as decentralized as possible. We want people to be able to extend the utility of Bitcoin and unlock some of the value that's currently in Bitcoin without giving up custody of their Bitcoin. So there's some new interesting products that have launched where it's like you can keep your Bitcoin on chain, but you can use it in things like lending, um, which wasn't possible before without stacks. It, when you guys are piggybacking off the security of Bitcoin, is it being merge mined by like Bitcoin miners? Is, is that how it's? No, being- so it's not being uh, merge mined. It actually creates a transaction in the in the Bitcoin chain. So it's just submitted there. And so you would need to like hack the Bitcoin chain in order to rewrite rewrite any of the old stacks transactions. So like the state of the stacks chain is getting written into the Bitcoin chain. But yeah, I, you know, I'm, um, we have a number of great computer scientists. Uh, if you want to go to the details of merge mining, I think there's actually a blog post because that question comes up a lot <laughs> about it. Um, for me, I'm like, okay, it's not merge mining, but um, I'm, I'm probably less able to go into the deep specifics of that. How, how is Stacks similar or different to um, other projects like RSK that are kind of trying to add utility to Bitcoin also? So the goal is um, to be as decentralized as possible. So, you know, being able to have independent miners who are mining instead of having um, things like more centralized like nodes or a centralized party who's kind of verifying that the information is correct. So the fact that like there are independent miners who are using just Bitcoin um, as part of the mining is a key piece of that. So, you know, I think there's anywhere from like 10 to 30 like miners, but it's completely open. Anyone can come in and mine. You don't need any special hardware. Like you could literally mine from your normal computer. You just have to have Bitcoin in order to participate. So it does make it very easy for people to participate. Um, obviously, if you want to be like incredibly profitable, like you probably want to have some know-how on how to uh, understand like what, what type of miner you're running. But we do have some open source miners like in our GitHub. If you wanted to try out, you could. And so I think the fact that it is so easy also is for the preference of it being more decentralized. And anyone can run a node as well. Like we have like a bunch of our team members run nodes, um, but anyone can run a node so that they can pull any data from the chain. Um, I feel like from a Bitcoin perspective, it's, you know, Stacks is very interesting, but there's this nagging feeling that I have that makes it feel, kind of feel like, um, I, I remember um, Ricardo did mention RSK and I feel like it's, I kind of see Stacks, forgive me, but I kind of see Stacks like a niche product for, um, very specific people within Bitcoin and not really, you know, mainstream, like the way, you know, remember you say you tried to, because, ob- you know, obviously, apparently you are, you know, actually competing for market share with um, other smart contracts platforms like Ethereum and the rest of them. So mm-hmm. how do you think, you know, um, has there been any validation for Stacks? Because I've seen some people, you know, just say, uh, um, people, I, I've seen arguments where people say that you know Stacks is trying to you know create smart contracts and smart contracts are not actually needed you know within the Bitcoin ecosystem as you know statement um, narratives like that. So how do you what what you know drives you know the Stacks you know equals what drives you, you know to continue pushing on? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think you know I believe that like smart contracts are really interesting primitive that can be used in incredible ways. And there are of course, multiple platforms that allow you to do that. But the real belief is that there's a ton of value and utility that Bitcoin provides that is not currently accessible. Right now, like if you wanted to use um, any of the Bitcoin value you hold or any of the places where Bitcoin is easily accessible or used on Ethereum, you would have to wrap it 
in order to utilize it in different places. And you know that usually means trusting a custodian or it could be in like a bridge and there's nothing native to actual Bitcoin. But when you think about the size and the scale of the market cap on Bitcoin, the fact that none of that gets to actually play in this whole smart contracts ecosystem seems like kind of like a miss. Like, you know, right now the Ethereum, like all of the value built on top of Ethereum is at the equivalent of the market cap of Ethereum. For Bitcoin, it's maybe like, you know, 5% of the value of what's built on top of Bitcoin relative to the value of Bitcoin. And to me, that, that's kind of like a missing piece. I think that one, Bitcoin is more ubiquitous, it's more secure, it's accepted everywhere. That whole payments layer, the fact that it's disconnected from any other type of more advanced transaction is kind of the missing piece. So, you know, whether it's Stacks or whether it's all these other chains, I think you're gonna see a lot more development on Bitcoin. And for me, I think that Stacks has taken this approach that we wanna make it secure. We want to expand the utility of this ecosystem. We're still very early, even though, you know, Ethereum has like a huge market share on smart contracts. I think we're barely scratching the surface of the amount of smart contracts that will exist and the amount of value and utility that they will have going forward. So kind of in my seven year perspective, it's like, it still feels really early. Nobody's won this race yet. I think there will be multiple chains that support value and it really comes down to what you're looking for. And Bitcoin being the most ubiquitous, the most secure, the highest value seems like an incredibly like opportunistic place to be building. Aside from smart contracts, Stacks allows people to issue tokens, uh, correct? Um, yeah, so you would be able to build just like Ethereum, you know, there's similar primitives. So if you wanted to issue a token, you can do so through things we have called app chains. Um, there's also proof of transfer light. And so that's how city coins um, launch. So like Miami coin, New York city coin, those projects, um, they basically use a similar model of proof of transfer. So miners burn stacks tokens instead of burning Bitcoin. Um, those stacks tokens that get uh, 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 burned, get redistributed, or they um, miners get back like Miami coin. So it's just basically all done in pre-mine. So uh, city coins, you know, they didn't do it like a pre-sale instead they just did a pre-mine. So like there's some interesting things being experimented on um, as well as some new tools like Alex, which helps uh, new tokens launch on top of stacks as well. So our smart contracts have been live for just over a year. So it was like January uh, last year that we kind of launched those smart contracts, even though we were in development for a long time. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that utility get added recently. Is, is Stacks using Solidity or, or some other uh, smart contracting language? Yeah, so it, um, we wrote our own smart contract language. It's called Clarity. It's also used by Algorand. And there's a few other projects I think that have looked into using it as well. Um, you know, I think this is maybe the big hurdle for anyone who's built in the Ethereum ecosystem before, you know, they would have to switch to writing in Clarity. Um, if you're familiar with like Rust programming languages, it's pretty similar. The benefit is like there's finality, you can run tests on it, it's very readable. So if you, you know, I would encourage all of you to go check out um, like our Explorer, you can see some of the transactions, you can read the smart contracts um, directly. And even if you're not like an advanced programmer, you can very easily understand what's happening in the contract. So that's like a key part. Yeah, the language sounds like a, a plus to me, because I guess the the more simple, the uh, the less scams and DAO hacks and whatever else you get coming with it, which happens a yeah. lot in the Ethereum world. Um, <laughs> well, so. even back to like, you know, the, the hack, the hack, or it wasn't even a hack a long time ago, it was a mistake that an engineer made and like ended up locking a ton of ETH. It was just like, there was no way to run a test on that before putting in production. And like, that's how Solidity is designed. And, you know, some people are like, oh, well then you can do anything you want with it, which is a good thing, but I think can also be a bad thing because when you're dealing with a lot of value, uh, it can be really risky if you don't have a way to run um, it natively to understand like what's gonna be the impact. And so that's like a big benefit of Clarity. Um, and, you know, at the foundation, we focus on education. So we have Clarity University, it's uh, our free learning. So if you want to like dabble with Clarity, we have all the documentation. We have these like cohorts where you can learn. Um, we try and make it, you know, super easy so people can just like dabble with it or, or you know, build something with it. I heard uh, that the Taproot soft fork is going to allow for more like smart contract functionality um, in Bitcoin. Does that impact Stacks at all with it being its own chain? Are you guys going to be able to leverage any of uh, those 
those new smart contracting abilities through Taproot? So the Taproot update, we also have a blog post that goes in more technical detail on this. Um, I would refer you there because again, I have our blockchain engineers go into the specifics. So at the high level, uh, Taproot is great. Taproot is great for Bitcoin. It brings more utility but it's in no way able to take on any sort of like large capacity of smart contracts. Like you wouldn't, you know, want to go like mint new NFTs there and try and sell and transact or even doing like large loans. Um, the Bitcoin chain is not meant to have like a ton of like transactions. Like they're not worried about transactions per second or some of these scaling solutions. So um, more functionality is great, but it's still very, very minor in terms of like adding utility to Bitcoin. So you still would need something to offload a bunch of the actual um, compute off of the Bitcoin chain, which is where Stacks is an option to do that. One of but the yeah, we, I... um, you know, at the Stacks Foundation, we believe in like the development of the Bitcoin chain. And there's actually this really nice symbiotic relationship that we actually have funded um, some Bitcoin core developers as well because like any upgrades to the Bitcoin chain are great for our chain. They're great for the ecosystem. So I think continuing to support any developments like that is a win for everyone in the ecosystem. Uh, now that you brought up the Stacks Foundation, like what do you guys do at the Stacks Foundation? Yeah, so like our focus is on kind of the three pillars of growing the ecosystem. Um, so supporting the open source blockchain. So helping make sure that new improvements uh, we help uh, facilitate the governance process of uh, stacks improvement proposals, our SIPs program. Um, we educate, so helping people understand how does the technology work, why is it important, um, how you can get started with it, including things like clarity. So how do you use the programming language? And then the third thing is grants. So we have a hundred million stacks treasury that we started with, and our goal is to deploy all of that into people building in the ecosystem. So building utility, um, everything from, yeah, funding Bitcoin core developers, because that's like a core component of our chain, as well as people building small smart contracts or building new infrastructure. We have like a number of bridges being built right now. I think one of them came through a grant. Uh, we have new DeFi uh, protocols on top. Those again, started off as grants, went through things like the Stacks Accelerator, so really it's just a place that we're here to support the ecosystem and help it grow and thrive uh, by spending that money on builders contributing. What about privacy on Stacks? I'm not really familiar with Stacks. What about privacy on Stacks? Is there any form of privacy on Stacks? If there isn't, are there, you know, are there you know, proposals to improve privacy on Stacks? This is a big yeah, deal. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, ours is similar to most of the top blockchains where uh, it's very transparent. Like you can see transactions, you can see what's going on. So um, we don't have something like Monero where you're kind of um, able to like easily obscure the transactions or the people doing the transactions. We don't have the functionality. Um, instead, we do think a lot about like identity. That's been like a core thesis of Stacks from the beginning is how can people control you know, pieces of their identity. And I think if you want to have like a synonymous <laughs> relationship to the chain, you would be able to do that. Um, you could set that up. You could have different stacks IDs. Uh, you know, you could have your own like dot BTC name instead of dot ETH name. Um, obviously getting into that point would require you to, to figure out if you wanted to stay anonymous, how to get into that. But once you're on there, um, you know, the goal is to be able to support people to represent their data online the way that they want to and have full control over it and not um, have to like worry about like a third party uh, tampering with it. So keeping it secure. But yeah, that's that's a that's different than like something like Monero. I'm assuming that's what you had in mind. For there's several projects like RGB and Synonym that are working on tokenization over Lightning. Um, mm -hmm. How would that impact stacks? That's a great question. I haven't like gone deeper on those two in particular. Uh, you know, I think, you know, from, let me think, 2018, we had like a big summit. We had Elizabeth Stark there. We had a number of talks on Lightning. I think it's a great, great feature for Bitcoin. I think it provides like a lot of rapid utility in terms of transactions. Um, so I, I see stacks as complementary to Lightning, um, but I do see that Lightning is like very limited in kind of what it can do. Um, I think we actually have a grant open right now that's looking 
Um, it's a designer who's looking to improve the UI of Bitcoin transactions, including things like Lightning. And so I think even at the Stacks Foundation, it doesn't have anything to do with Stacks, but I think helping people understand that component of Bitcoin is really important. So we're looking to fund that type of research and hopefully get that out there. Especially when you think of things like in El Salvador, there's an incredible adoption of, of Bitcoin. I think that's a great place for Lightning transactions. I don't think that's a great place for using smart, uh, stack smart contracts to exchange Bitcoin um, and like, you know, in small settings. Um, instead, you could think about maybe in El Salvador, you have a wallet of Bitcoin that you're using, but you want to participate in DeFi primitives like lending or borrowing. Um, you could use the stacks chain with your native Bitcoin to do that instead of having to trust like a third party custody provider. Um, and then maybe on your day to day transactions, you're using something like Lightning with your Bitcoin. I remember you mentioned um, um, Stacks is all about unlocking the, the, the value in Bitcoin and you compared it to Ethereum and other smart contracts platform. And when I think about smart contracts platform, I think of gambling, basically, you know, people go to Uniswap, you know, exchange, exchange shitcoin for the next shitcoin, DeFi farming and other buzzwords. And um, I'd like to know for someone who might you know, be interested in saying, okay, I want to give Stacks, you know, a try. What does Stacks has, you know, have to offer as a stance? What are the most promising projects coming out of the Stacks ecosystem? Yeah, I think, um, well, in some ways we maybe benefited by being not EVM compatible because a lot of the people, you know, a lot of other chains, they, they suffer from this project, like people swarm in, there's a bunch of spammy, scammy stuff, a bunch of people drive up the price and then they leave to the next chain. Um, so I think because it's like, it's a little harder to operate between our chain and others right now. Um, and then right now we don't sort of have that problem, but I guess we'll see. Um, but yeah, I think if like you have stacks today, some of the things people are doing are one, the simplest is just stacking. So you're like, okay, well, I want to buy some stacks. Um, I don't know how I want to use them yet. You can participate in stacking by locking your stacks tokens and earn a Bitcoin yield. So that's, like I said, a 10% yield. If you don't meet the threshold of 100,000 stacks or above, you can pool with other people. Um, there's a number of exchanges that now make this easy. So like OKCoin, um, Binance just supported it, uh, BitGo. And then there's some community pools like Friedger Pool where you can pool your stacks with them and you can lock them as long as you like. You can either do a two week cycle or up to uh, six months. And so that's like a very passive way to get involved um, and earn Bitcoin, which people really like. <laughs> um, so that's one. I think like if you wanna get more involved than that, there's some DeFi primitives. So Arcadico is one of those. So if you're familiar with something like a MakerDAO where you're able to borrow and lend, um, Arcadico is the platform right now that's kind of the leading thing on Stacks where you can lock your Stacks tokens, you can um, swap them for the stable coin, you can use them in loans. Um, they have this idea of a self-repaying loan because if you take out a loan, they're holding your Stacks tokens and that Bitcoin yield on those Stacks tokens can actually go against the interest and the principal that you earn. So like, what if you took out a loan and you never actually repaid the principal, you just held it there because of stacking, you could repay it. So that's kind of the mentality there. Um, there's also tons of NFTs. I think this is like, you know, last year was the year of NFTs. So you can go to like stxnft.com or Byzantian. Um, all of these marketplaces exist where you can use uh, Stacks tokens to like mint NFTs, buy NFTs, trade NFTs. I think there's obviously a lot of excitement um, around that. Uh, so we, you know, we have similar things as those smart contracts. And then there are some new like DEXs that are launching um, like StackSwap. Um, Alex is like the other one, alex.btc. Uh, you can look it up uh, on Twitter or on their website and they're another uh, DeFi primitive. So they like allow lending and some of these more advanced DeFi pieces. Something that um, is interesting to me is obviously what you said earlier about like um, wanting to be involved in a project that's making a difference in the cryptocurrency landscape and and kind of uh, having a reason, I guess, and a difference to make. Uh, so when it comes to stacks, there's obviously a lot of uh, things you can do, like the smart contract capabilities and the NFTs, etc. What for you is the the biggest kind of or the main problem that is being solved by stacks? Uh, what is your kind of 
why i guess around like okay well this is you know I, we are solving this issue uh in the world and that's why i think you know i, I want to be here and why i'm enjoying working here what, what what is that for you yeah yeah i think that vision like expands to like the wider web3 so i may um I believe in the multi-chain world, obviously just having stacks and Bitcoin alone are two chains, but you know, I'm, I'm very familiar with a number of the other chains. I've, you know, I've spent a lot of time um, in the multi-chain universe. And so I don't think it's just stacks, but I do think that there is this, you know, I believe that there's a vision that there's a lot of power that happens when you can allow people to contribute to things they care about um, and make changes. And I think to me, I'm very optimistic that we can have like an impact on like, how do we think about um, the climate? How do we think about solving energy problems when there's a lot more people and a lot more capital that's accessible to work on those things in collaboration? So that's like sort of my utopian future. I think like, yeah, we could like get together and help, you know, change uh, policies or fund big audacious ideas uh, with groups of people who now have access to like their financial assets in a different way. So it's kind of like my long view, but I think a good example of this is the Miami coin. Like this was something that, you know, an independent team conceived this idea, they built this idea and in the past you know, like eight months, they've been able to make it happen. They said like, we think that the residents of Miami want to have a say in how things are going in their city. So we want to create this city coin model built on top of stacks where people can hold Miami tokens. And those tokens represent like your, you know, sort of investment in the city, whether you live there or not, doesn't matter. But if you're holding those tokens, you know that 30% of the yield from mining is going into a wallet that the city of Miami gets to control. So with that, that's kind of like audacious, but then they actually got the mayor involved and interested. So the mayor went through the legislative process to be able to accept this wallet on behalf of the city. And so already, I think they've raised about $30 million in Bitcoin in that wallet. They actually went ahead and signed 5.25 million of that wallet towards low income housing. So basically further subsidizing some subsidies that were gonna end for individuals in Miami. Now 5 million of that is going from this wallet that didn't exist before. And to me, that's like, super cool that like people are able to have a direct impact in a city by working across this like collaborative group of people having like audacious ideas and then getting the right like decision makers to like make an impact so to me i think you could think about that in a in a larger scale like wow wouldn't it be great if there's like a, a cleaner energy plant created instead of like a dirtier one like how could people come together to think about the funding and the legislative and the um capital intensity in order to like make that happen. But if you get enough people who feel like they're invested in it and they actually have some say in what's gonna happen, then maybe it's like possible. So that's that's where I'm excited about it. Obviously when it comes down to just like smart contracts, being able to trade value, it doesn't feel like those two things connect. But I think that city coins example is like super fascinating. And we've seen such excitement that now there's like a New York city coin um, there's an Austin city coin coming. Like there's a bunch of people who are just excited about this. Obviously who doesn't love like a big wallet full of money <laughs> for them to do stuff, but to actually take the risk and listen to what people are saying about what they want in their city and taking action against it. Like that's, that's like the hypothesis that's like coming true. That's uh, that's pretty cool. I like it. So it's kind of like, um, yeah, with that, there's, there's kind of bringing elements of decentralization to like funding of a centralized uh, thing, I guess. So like when it comes to the city, yeah, okay, it's going to be going to the mayor, but the mayor's agreeing to do what the people are voting for. So obviously there's still some reliance on centralization, but like that's kind of, you know, um, to be expected, I suppose, at this point in time. Okay, I get you. Um, I guess like one of the things, I guess coming into the centralization, decentralization aspect, one of the things that's always been a bit of a gripe for me with Ethereum was that there was this huge pre-mine and and kind of some shiftiness uh, around the initial creation of the token. Like when it comes to stacks, like because obviously you guys have a token, right? And I know that's something that um, Bitcoin maximalists can get upset by. Um, so what when it comes to the token, like how was that in the first place? Like how was that created? Like was there some uh, pre-mine like distribution? Like how how did that all happen? Because I'm not super familiar with the history there. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm very familiar with history, so I'm happy to weigh in. And actually, yeah, I've um, if you want the full detailed history, we actually had to do and we did our SEC filing to go through every um, portion of our token distribution. Uh, it's 121 pages. I have read all of them multiple times because <laughs> we had multiple edits, and it goes into every single detail of where the tokens went, who they belong to, how many they have. So I think we're maybe one of two projects that have gone that thoroughly to say like we want to be as transparent as possible so um originally one name raised venture capital from usv who's an investor there um, they had an equity base they decided to do a token sale in 2017 at the time there was no way to offer it to non-accredited investors in the us so like anyone could participate but if you weren't accredited you couldn't they realized like that was a problem because most developers weren't accredited, people didn't have this kind of certification. So what they did is they said, okay, anyone who wants to participate, but can't, because they're not accredited, we're gonna give you a voucher up to $3,000 at today's price. So that was a 12 cent price. And they said, okay, we're gonna find a way to be able to offer you guys tokens at this price. So basically spent the next two years working through the regulatory in order to um, do a regulated offering qualified by the SEC. So that was the Reg A in 2019. Um, so I joined just before that to help them do this. And that process, we were able to open it up to everyone. Now, if you had the original um, voucher, it meant that you could have the 12 cent price up to $3,000 worth. Uh, but anyone could buy um, at the new price, which was 30 cents. Um, so if you didn't have a voucher, you could just get it at the 30 cent price. And so both of those funding rounds were sales of the Genesis block. So basically making it as easy and as accessible as possible to folks. So a majority of the Genesis block got sold through that. Um, there were some early investors who had a portion of the tokens allocated to them because of their early investment. Um, and then like, you know, there's some team um, as well. And then there's some treasuries put aside. So the Stacks Foundation has $100 million or 100 million stacks out of that initial treasury that was put aside towards community treasury. There's a number of other treasury tokens that were given um, to a various uh, ecosystems. Some of them are still locked. Um, so the goal was to be as fair as possible, to put very long lockups on people. So most people who participate in the first sale had like a at least a two-year lockup. Some of them had up to an eight-year lockup if they were a larger fund. Um, same with the 2017 or 2019, people had a two-year lockup. So the goal was like to try and make it fair and and um, make sure people kept skin in the game even as the project launched. Uh, but yeah, we have a full token white paper as well that can go into detail. But I think the key is like the goal was to be as fair and as transparent as possible and to get tokens in the hands of builders um, and then also allow for new stacks tokens to be mined. So people who come in today can still get access to brand new stacks tokens by participating in mining, which, like I said, you don't need advanced hardware. You just need Bitcoin to participate. Is the stacks ecosystem like kind of self-contained or is there a way to send um, stacks tokens to other blockchains or, or other Bitcoin tokenization platforms like Liquid or RSK? Like, is, yeah, is there so, a way to atomic swap or something? Yeah, so atomic swaps um, exist. This is something that like a community member built and you can see the code on GitHub, um, so it's live. You can also use what they call catamaran swaps, um, also on the Bitcoin chain. Um, and then there's four bridges that now exist or being built uh, in the Stacks ecosystem. The first one is the uh, Satoshables bridge. They basically bridged between Ethereum NFTs to um, Stacks NFTs. So they were able to bring those um, NFTs across. There's the Magic Bridge. Um, there's uh, Damon launched its bridge called All Bridge, <laughs> and then there's there's a fourth bridge as well, which I'm like now just blanking the name. I have to look at my notes. But there are bridges because people are thinking about that, or there are the atomic swaps. So if you want to keep things on Bitcoin, you can just use um, atomic swaps as well. So if you want to build anything in this area, though, we have grants. <laughs> Sorry, there's, there's a lag on my side. I was just saying, I was wishing I'm a, I was a developer so I could go get a grant and start making some stuff. But uh, yeah, it's not well, my can, area of expertise. You could get a grant by too, just like maybe playing around with, you know, tools. We have um, 
someone got a grant because they wanted to educate the Polish community about sex. So they just, you know, it was like a, maybe a few hundred dollars. They made some video content. They did some educational tools and made it. So you don't have to be a de developer to get a grant. Uh, there's lots of ways to contribute besides just. And how many projects are you guys currently funding uh, through your grant program? Um, last year, we, I think we did a half a million in grant funding. I think in this quarter already, we've, um, we've granted around 400K. So we're like on track to like almost double our last year just in this quarter, um, which is great. And people are building all sorts of, uh, uh, people are building stuff with stacks. They're, like I said, doing research projects um, around design. I think that's like very needed. Uh, we also have things called stacks chapters where we have geographic chapters where people are hosting events they're um, creating content, they're, you know, supporting local uh, development of the SACS ecosystem as well. So like, that's another big program that's been pretty successful. Uh, how large would you say the stock ecosystem is? Because um, how, I'm asking because how much influence does the um, stacks uh, Foundation have over the, you know, larger um, um, stack ecosystem, you know, to influence things because, uh, you know, I think one of the biggest lure things that lure people into the Ethereum Solana ecosystem is airdrops. And mm -hmm. they do sound, you know, funny. It's like free money. But I think some of these things to help to incentivize people to actually grants are good. You know, airdrop is basically free money that goes, you know, to everybody. So uh, how well, I'm asking how diverse is the ecosystem in the stars community, you know, people to uh, no, the free flow, free flow of ideas, or is everybody just trying to, you know, try to conform themselves to what um, stacks, stacks, you know, vision, basically? Yeah, um, no, I think that's a great question. I was just like pulling up some stats. Um, yeah, I think that in some ways, I think we benefit from right now, we see a lot of organic growth, and there's not a real push to say, like, we're just going to like airdrop and or like trying to give things away to get like a number of traders or people who are here just for the financial incentive or you know trading free money sort of thing um we did do an airdrop back in 20 uh i think it was 2020 early 2020 with blockchain.com um so that brought in a number of, of people who were interested but we decided sort of against doing you know at the foundation we wouldn't do an airdrop because like that doesn't really go into our mission in terms of size, uh, like we're just over 400,000 addresses for Stacks. We just crossed the million dollar Stacks transactions mark. Um, so in one year, 12 months, we're just over a million. We've had 200,000 NFTs minted on Stacks. Um, you know, I think like last week alone, it was like 700,000 in trading volume, um, which, uh, you know, it's like smaller than um, what you see like on Ethereum, but like sort of growing this idea of like Bitcoin NFTs. Uh, we also have, you know, just, I think we have like about 50 companies that are built on top of stacks. Our goal is like, you know, how many, like how much value can be created by other organizations on top of stacks. So it's less about our token. It's more about these other projects. And that's where, you know, I talk about Architico, City Coins, um, Alex, Sw Stack Swap. There's like a lot of people who are taking this idea and using the technology to do what they envision for the future. And so like, that's really our goal. At the Stacks Foundation, we're one of probably 20 entities that are supporting different aspects of the ecosystem. So there's a company called Hero Systems. They are focused on, um, on the tooling. Like, so just developer tooling built on Clarity on Stacks. There's Trust Machines. It's a $150 million um, building studio that's focused on helping grow like new infrastructure. They actually just announced a protocol called Zest Protocol last week. That's thinking about how you can bring like a lot of financial primitives to Bitcoin. And um, there's the Stacks Accelerator. That's a separate company. They uh, invest in early stage companies and help them build, get from like idea to launch. So they, I think had 20 companies go through the last class. They have another 20 going through the new one. Uh, we have the Mintry, which is, uh, this is in-house right now at the foundation, but it's an experiment in helping accelerate NFT projects um, with artists and creators and um, musicians to be able to launch something in the world on blockchains. So like that's taking off now. 
there's Damon, they focus just on miners and mining support and bridges. So there's like all of these different players. So our goal is like, if the foundation went away tomorrow, there would be a ton of activity happening that doesn't rely on us for stuff to get built. And, you know, our goal is to be like way less important as the ecosystem goes on because there's so much that's like happening and there's like a lot of commercial value. We eventually will probably not need to support anything commercial because we can just focus on, you know, giving grants for things that aren't very commercialized, like governance and blockchain development and educating people. So that's that's like our long-term goal um, and how you can think about the foundation with all those pieces. Kind of a rambling it, answer, but I'm like, oh yeah, there's it's like a big map of people. <laughs> so does that mean we're gonna see the metaverse, the, the metaverse on Saks pretty soon? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's actually a really cool game called um, uh, Moonray and they have this like, you know, I think of the, you know, sometimes metaverse, you imagine like the VR headset and you're in like this cool 3D world. I feel like they kind of nailed the like vision of what the future in a headset would look like. It's not headset based, but that's just what I think of. Um, but I think, I don't know, it feels like we're already living in the metaverse. Like how much of our lives is already online? Like you guys are people, but like, it's all digital. Like if this internet went away, a lot of the stuff that we're doing wouldn't work anymore. We'd have to change our jobs. We'd have to go do something else because our lives are already so entwined with our digital selves. So I'm a, I'm like, we're kind of already in the metaverse, but that's my opinion. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, is there, are there stable coins on stacks? Uh, yeah, I think there's um, right now there's um, USDA, which is through Arcadico. It's a new stable coin. USDC, I think there's a company working with um, Circle on USDC being on stacks. And then there's things like XBTC, which isn't a stable coin, but it's like wrapping Bitcoin that's enabled by stacks as well. So I know that there's a number of people in our ecosystem that want more stable coins on stacks. So uh, we're like, great. Yeah, we'd love to see that too. Uh, but we, you know, are just waiting for those people to kind of build those things. <laughs> you just mentioned XBTC. Are, are stockholders paid in BTC or XBTC? Um, when they're stacking, they get Bitcoin. You got Bitcoin in your wallet. So yeah, if you go to stacking.club, you can see kind of like the rewards and things paid out. Uh, this is beneficial for the Stacks Foundation because we stack portions of our treasury and that Bitcoin we've um, we use to fund operations so we don't have to liquidate our treasury to fund normal operations we also have like I said made donations to causes that are in line um, with our future vision which includes like brink.dev where they're supporting core developers in Bitcoin so we can just stack for um, for causes and actually we're helping build a product through our grants program called stacking for causes so if you wanted to allocate a portion of your stacking rewards to something you, you know, a philanthropic effort or something like that, you would be able to do that. So you're not actually giving up any of your stacks. You're just giving off some of that extra yield that you're getting. Uh, in an answer to your question earlier about like the metaverse and things like that, I, uh, yeah. I, I kind of agree with you that um, we're kind of already getting towards that, if not somewhat having some form of metaverse. I mean, I've got like my Oculus Quest and I have to have a Facebook account connected to that to when I want to do anything on that. And then uh, there's all this, like, you know, my, my banking is online, my crypto funds and spending is online. It's probably linked to my Amazon, which is linked to this, which is linked to that. Uh, my wish.com account is, I think, is linked to one of my social media accounts when I buy crap that doesn't work online. So I suppose you're somewhat right. But I, I guess, like, when people think of Metaverse, they, they think of this uh ready, ready player, player one, one. <laughs> yeah ready player one. Yeah. like this ultra cringy oh, yeah, I've read <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i'm in the metaverse oh my word hey I guys think, yeah. i think we need augmented yeah. reality for it to be considered the metaverse <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I love my vr headset but like i don't want it to extend beyond some gaming and a bit of like messing around in like a virtual world i wouldn't want it to become like the actual world and i think a lot of people um are fearful of that and i guess i have that boomer mindset where i'm a little bit scared of like being stuck in this like vr world because the real world's gone to shit and then like you know uh, having like a super also i hate the idea that like google and or facebook and a few other small companies will basically own everything with and run everything and it will all be run on aws or whatever and i hate the idea of that so i'm keen i'm keen to see these like web3 kind of metaverse kind of things go and give it a shot albeit Sometimes I'm a bit like old fashioned thinking, well, hey, like a lot of the web three stuff 
doesn't really seem to solve much of a problem to me yet. But then I guess we'll see where it goes, right? That's the the way. Uh, yeah. The way I think. I, you know, I kind of think I I agree with Brittany because you know people tend to share a different version of themselves online. You know, anybody can be whoever they want to be. You could be rich. You know, you could be you know you could pretend to be rich. You could pretend to be you know, anything, you know, you want to be online, you know, people, you know, do live double, do lead, you know, double lives and they decide which version of themselves, you know, they want to share. They only show the, like, I had to, I remember someone saying that, you know, social media is basically your highlight reel. And, mm -hmm. you know, people might not get to know the true you, you know, when they see you on social media, they're like, oh, this guy living such an amazing life. Meanwhile, you know, the person is probably depressed. And, you know, but yeah, I still want to kick ass in the, you know, do ready player one shit. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah no, i'm with you i have i have like the very old htc vive headset where you like need a whole room and you're like wired to the back like i'm like all for living in like a, a digital world like creating 3d paintings and like yeah it's like it's dope so i'm like very here for that but yeah i mean i, I personally do think that like what i don't like about the current internet in some ways is that everything almost forces you to be a single identity and I think that people are way more expressive and like having a pseudo identity is like a superpower. The fact that like you could show up in a community and like just be an artist and like, it doesn't matter about any of the other things that you do or care about. Like you don't have to be a slash. I'm like an artist slash this, slash this, slash this. Um, I think like back in the day we invested in a, in Tumblr. I don't know if anyone used Tumblr um, in the day, but I did, what yeah. I loved about it is like, you got to have like a single view of of your different um, thread, like almost like your newsfeed, but you could have multiple different blogs that you would have. Like I had one that was just like for art that I like found around the web. I thought it was cool. I wanted to collect it somewhere and it existed. And then I also had my blogging where I was like writing stuff um, that was more related to my job. And then like, I had another one that was just for friends. Like, I don't need to be the same person like in all of those different contexts. Like my friends don't care that I'm writing about crypto. You know, my uh, my crypto people don't care about the art that I think is like interesting. So I think it's okay to bring those together, but I would love to live in a world where you can have these different trusted identities that are all you, but you don't have to show up as like, I'm Brittany in this space. Like I could be, you know, um, something synonymous. So I love that. I know that creates problems because people are like, well, what about security and spammers and like all this, bad stuff that can come from, um, you know, pseudo accounts, but I do think that it actually gives people way more freedom to exist and uh, be like their diverse selves that they can be like, you know, out in the world. It's like you go to the grocery store, no one cares who you are. <laughs> but if you show up in a Twitter space and you like are a bored ape, people like know something about you. I don't know. <laughs> go for yeah, it. yeah. Um, this might be a little bit, you know, off topic, uh, but there has been some arguments that, um, women are not unrepresented in crypto or are, are not well represented in crypto and there's all this back and forth i saw some um a lady on twitter you know arguing that you know the space is so toxic and you know toxic masculinity and all of that and um some people are like no that you have to come in you know you have to come in early you know there's no barrier to entry so why do you think women are you know I'm not too well represented in crypto. Yeah, I mean, I like, I've had this conversation, I feel like my entire career, because I was like an entrepreneur who raised venture capital as a woman. Like I was a woman in VC. There's like less than 10% of uh, of, um, of the VC industry is women. I was a woman in Web3, like six years ago, <laughs> seven years ago. I ran my own fund. Like the number of women who actually do that is like so small. So it's like constantly this, like, there's not enough women here. <laughs> like, we're here. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I do think that like sometimes uh, there are a lot of um, places where it's just traditionally there, there have been less women. So it feels like more alienating. Like if you're getting in the VC industry, it's still really bad to have so many women. It doesn't mean there aren't any women. It just, yeah, the majority are not um, as like a baseline, but that's changing. It's gotten so much better in the decades since I first raised VC. I think it's getting better. I think Web3 is a wide open space. And maybe a lot of people who already were very involved in tech, the majority of which are men, not 80%, but maybe 50%, then you're going to see that in Web3. But there are toxic people everywhere you go. So I just advise people, like, don't pay attention to the people you don't want to work with. Like, don't work with assholes. Just ignore them. 
find the people who actually support you who you are and they don't care if you're a woman or not or they are extra supportive because they know that you can be treated differently if you're a woman in the space so i like that people keep having that conversation why aren't there more women but it's also why aren't there more people from this country why aren't there more representation from these industries um so i think it's just one of those that we have to keep doing but if someone comes to you and they're being bullied just say like hey i'm here to help you and make sure that you aren't getting treated differently so be an ally um to people who maybe are feeling that way because there are i don't know i'm sure you guys have dealt with it too there's like a lot of trolls and if you're not used to, used to dealing with trolls like it's a new experience <laughs> so, uh like learn how to deal with them we have like a little tro uh troll slaying advice we give to new employees in crypto who are just like very eager and then all of a sudden they get like these really crappy like trolled twitter tweets or something and they're like ah <laughs> twitter can be brutal <laughs> ignore ignore the trolls yeah don't feed the trolls the, the typical advice but, um, oh. yeah i would love to have more women like look at this panel like at least we're getting some we're getting some like diverse people diverse backgrounds it looks like diverse locations you guys like someone looks you look like you're in like a cabin you look like you're in europe <laughs> you're in the metaverse with the blurry background like yeah we're 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 trying to be representative of the real world uh, you're right though it's, we are a diverse group because I'm, I'm from england uh originally as you could probably tell from the accent um but i'm not in europe though so you guessed that wrong so, uh, i was like looking at the ac on your wall and like maybe some ikea you were celebrating three years to the day for what Be being full-time in crypto yeah so with stacks so yeah i joined um hero systems which at the time was called block stack and some rebrand um but yeah i started in february of 2019 with um block stack like full-time awesome well it's a milestone for us as well because you're our 40th uh, podcast guest. This is our 40th episode. So Woo! we're both celebrating. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Damn, we've really done 40 of these. That's crazy. Yeah. I couldn't That's believe amazing. it either. That's like 40 hours. That's amazing. How long have you guys been doing it? Wait, when did you start? Uh, well, when did uh, you start? Like a year, maybe, maybe more or less. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. That's not very long. Yeah. Someone yeah. tweeted that like quote the other day. It was like something like Will Smith. He's like, you don't set out to build a brick wall. You just lay a brick one at a time. <laughs> That's what you guys did 40 episodes yeah. amazing <laughs> our first episode was nothing like this either it was like we had like a whole we were like we were talking about the week and the news and then we had like a guest in sometimes and whatever and then we realized actually we just want to talk to people who are interesting about interesting things so let's just do that instead and then it, yeah here we are now yeah well i know we're on the hour otherwise i'd be like yeah i just want to talk to you guys about the things that interest you because i think <laughs> you've seen a lot more you know you're like up looking around at the world and seeing what's happening so it's very cool can you please Tell us about hyperchain. I'm seeing something on Twitter and yeah. Yeah. But that's a big secret. Yeah. Well, hyperchains, yes. Yeah. So um this is something that isn't like built out of the Stacks Foundation. Like we're decentralized. So this is coming out of a different uh, company, I think oh. out of Hero um, system. So they've been working really hard on it. So I'm anxious to read their announcement on Twitter. I saw that they were announcing, but I think the basics are hyperchains provide a way to run more transactions simultaneously. Usually a trade-off of more centralization. So like you're able to get faster um, transaction times, but maybe it's more, um, it's going through uh, fewer, um, blanking on the word, like fewer confirmations in order to get there. So you kind of risk that maybe you don't want like a super high value transaction through there, but maybe something like swapping an NFT makes sense on a hyper chain. So it basically just extends the um, the speed, but it does have that sort of centralization versus decentralization trade off. Not that it's centralized, but it's just more centralized than than the uh, than the regular chain. Like if you approve things to the regular chain. But what's cool is I think there's like multiple hyper chains that can kind of like run simultaneously. The way I think about it is like they're actually like sub layers. I think actually they started calling it subnets, and now they call it hyper chains. But basically, it's like a chain that runs in parallel that ultimately gets finalized back on the Bitcoin um, block, or back on the Stacks chain, which will then go back on the Bitcoin block eventually. But yeah, check out the Twitter. I think like at Manib, he's uh, the original founder of Stacks. He now is at Trust Machines. He does a lot of really cool work on um, hyperchain. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for the explanation. Thank you for for joining us today. It's been awesome to have you. 
Um, is there anything you want to say, like anything you want to plug or say before you, before you head out? Yeah. So um, if you're interested in learning more about Stacks, stacks.org, that's the foundation's website. We have a lot of information there. Um, Twitter is a great place to follow. We have like over 100,000 Twitter followers at Stacks, S-T-A-C-K-S. And then, um, yeah, if you're thinking about building and you're not, you know, you're like, oh, maybe I want to learn to code clarity or maybe have this idea, I think maybe it would make a good grant. Um, come on over. Like we're a very friendly community. Everyone's very kind right now. I feel like uh, we have a really great community. So um, please just like let us know what you're thinking. And if we can be helpful, like we'd love to work with you. Sounds awesome. Very, uh, very awesome. Okay. Well, yeah. Anyone out there listening, you heard it. Uh, you heard it here first or second or third. But uh, everyone listening as well, thank you for listening. And we hope you have an awesome day, week, month, year, lifetime, whatever. Um, and yeah, keep being happy, keep loving life and keep buying Bitcoin. Thanks very much. See you later.